Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Prescott. I'm here at Psych Sync, to Sync Psychology, and today we're going to be starting Chapter 14, Stress, Lifestyle, and Health from the OpenStax Psychology 2E online textbook. So, without further ado, let's get started. So, what is stress? This chapter explores our current understanding of stress, including psychological and physiological natures, causes and consequences, and stress management techniques. So, continuing on, what is stress? Stress is a term used loosely to describe a variety of unpleasant feeling states. For example, frustrated, angry, conflicted, overwhelmed, or fatigued. Uh, Stimulus-based definitions, stress is a demanding or threatening event slash situation. So, a high-stress job, like serving in the military. Um, it characterizes stress as a stimulus that causes certain reactions and fails to recognize that people differ in how they view and react to challenging situations. And then there's response-based definitions, which emphasize physiological responses that occur in response to demanding or threatening situations and characterizes stress as a response to environmental conditions, but neither provide a complete definition of stress. So here we have some cognitive appraisals. So for a cognitive appraisal, stress is a process whereby an individual perceives and responds to events he appraises as overwhelming or threatening to his well-being. This definition places importance on how we appraise or judge uh, demanding or threatening events, stressors, which then influence our reaction. So the primary appraisal is a judgment about the degree of potential harm slash threat to well-being that a stressor might entail. A threat is a stressor that could lead to harm slash loss slash negative consequences. And a challenge is a stressor that carries the potential for gain slash personal growth. So it's a challenge. Ooh, if I complete this challenge, you know, I get the treasure chest at the end, um, for example. But anyways, you get the point. So, example, graduating from college and entering the workplace can be viewed as either a threat, because you lose the financial support, or a challenge, opportunity for independence and growth. Now, secondary appraisal, 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 good lord, guys is a judgment of the options available to cope with a stressor and perceptions of how effective such options will be. Uh, a threat is less stressful if we believe something can be done about it. So, cognitive appraisals. Stress is less likely or is likely to result if a stressor is perceived as extremely threatening or threatening with few or no effective coping options available. So here we have a chart, stressor, then the primary appraisal is challenge or threat. If it's a challenge, potential for gain or growth, but if you perceive it as a threat, then it may lead to harm, loss, or negative consequences. Now, then you have a secondary appraisal. What are potential options and how effective? So effective options are low threat, but ineffective or no options equals high threat. So it's a nice chart to look at for cognitive appraisals. So good stress, what is good stress? So use stress is stress that can be positive and motivate us to do things in our best interest associated with positive feelings, optimal health, and performance. Now, distress is the bad, you know, bad stress, uh, causing people to feel burned out, so fatigued and exhausted, and performance to decline. So here we have a chart, you know, performance level go to high, stress level go to high. Right here, you have an optimal level. Here's your stress, you stress, so good stress, and distress, or bad. So as the stress level increases from low to moderate, so does performance. At the optimal level, so the peak of the curve right here, performance has reached its peak. If stress exceeds the optimal level, it will reach the distress region, where it will become excessive and debilitating, and performance will decline. So you can think of, if you're wondering to yourself, well, what would constitute you know, the peak where you're at your peak performance due to stress? You don't have too little, but you don't have too much. That would be like, you know, you have a big exam coming up, but so you, it motivates you to start studying uh, a week or two in advance, and so that amount of stress, the peak of it, is enhancing your performance. Whereas if you have too much stress, say you waited to the last minute, it could decrease your performance because you're too freaked out about the exam to get any actual good studying done. So the prevalence of stress. Stress is everywhere and plays a role in all of our lives to some extent. Stress can evoke a variety of responses, including physiological, so accelerated heart rate, headaches, or gastrointestinal problems. There's cognitive uh, responses, which are difficulty concentrating or making decisions, and then behavioral, or drinking, so drinking alcohol, smoking, or taking actions directed at eliminating the cause of stress. So here we have a chart, uh, change in stress levels over the past five years. This light blue is an, an increase by 44%, orange decreased, and purple stayed the same. So nearly half of U.S. adults indicated that their stress levels have increased over the last five years. So that's not good. 
And next we have health psychology. So health psychology is a subfield devoted to understanding the importance of psychological influences on health, illness, and how people respond when they become ill. It investigates the connection between stress and illness, why people make certain life choices, the effectiveness of interventions aimed at changing unhealthy behaviors, and which groups of people are especially at risk for negative health outcomes and based on psychological or behavioral factors. Now, stress among demographic groups. National surveys found that there is higher stress in women than in men, and higher stress, higher levels of stress in those that were unemployed, had less education, and less income. And retired persons reported, loaded, reported lowest levels of stress. In from 2006 to 2009 was the greatest increase in stress levels occurred among men, whites, people aged 45 to 64, college graduates, and those with full-time employment. Uh, the change potentially due to the 2008-2009 economic shutdown, which I would think is a pretty good guess. So here we have some charts, stress among demographic groups. So the charts above, adapted from Cohen and Janicki Deverts in 2012, depict the mean stress level scores among different demographic groups during the years 1983, 2006, and 2009. Stress levels generally show a marked increase over this quarter century time span. So here you can see, you know, they're all different uh, or categories, so I don't want to break them all down. We have sex, age, race, education, employment, and income. So as you go up, your mean stress score increases, and that shows the year. So you can see over time, you know, men became more stressed, and so did women. Um, here, everybody but, like I said, retired people had the lowest amount of stress, but their age went up. All these different categories, the stress you can see went up except for unemployed. That actually went down around 2006. So then we have you know, a clear picture right here, same charts, just more enhanced. So, early contributions to the study of stress. So Walter Cannon in the early 20th century was the first to identify the body's physiological reactions to stress. And he first articulated and named the fight or flight response, which we talked about in an earlier chapter. Uh, which he suggested is a built-in mechanism that stabilizes physiological variables at levels optimal for survival. So, quick refresher, the fight or flight response is a set of, a physiological, set of physiological reactions that occur when an individual encounters a perceived threat, uh, produced by activation of the sympathetic nervous system and the endocrine system. This arousal prepares a person to either fight or flee from a perceived threat, and an adaptive response helpful in species survival. So again, fight or flight response. In response to a threatening stressor, the adrenal glands release epinephrine or adrenaline and no repinephrine or no adrenaline, which causes physiological changes in the body as shown below. So, you know, if you have adrenaline, your pupils dilate, heart rate increases, muscles tense and may tremble, uh, respiration quickens, so bronchial tubes dilate, and perspiration begins to start to sweat. Now, general adaptation syndrome uh, so Hans Selye, Selye uh, specialized in research about stress. He noticed that prolonged exposure to stressors caused rats to show signs of adrenal enlargement, thymus and lymph node shrinkage, and stomach ulceration. The same pattern of physiological reactions occurred regardless of the stressor, so it was just stress over time, prolonged exposure. Uh, Selye had discovered the general adaptation syndrome, the body's nonspecific physiological response to stress. So there are three stages. Alarm reaction, the body's immediate reaction upon facing a threatening situation or emergency. Physiological reactions that provide energy to manage the situation. Then we have the stage of resistance. The body has adapted or readjusted to the stressor, but remains alert and prepared to respond with less intensity. It's a physiological reactions diminish. Then we have the stage of exhaustion. The person can no longer adapt to the stressor, depletion of physical resources, and physical wear takes its toll on the body's tissues and organs, so this may result in illness, disease, or death. So prolonged exposure to stress is really not good. So here we have general adaptation syndrome again. The three stages of Selye's general adaptation syndrome are shown in this graph. Prolonged stress ultimately results in exhaustion. So here you can have the stress resistance, the alarm reaction, like this is the normal level. You can see it go up, and resistance. And then in the resistance phase, the stress resistance, but then when then the exhaustion, stress resistance goes down by a lot. So the physiological basis of stress. So the sympathetic nervous system triggers arousal in response to a stressor via the release of adrenaline from the adrenal glands. 
And the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis uh, has stress, leads to hypothalamus releases, cortico corticotrophin, uh, corticotrophin releasing factor or hormone, and then the pituitary gland releases ACTH, then ACTH activates the adrenal glands, then the adrenal glands release hormones including cortisol. Now cortisol is a stress hormone that helps provide a boost of energy when we first encounter a stressor, preparing us to fight or flee. I shouldn't say fight, why I say flight or flee, it's the same thing. Um, continuals, uh, continuous elevated levels of cortisol and chronic stress weaken the immune system so you get sick more easily. In moments of stress, this process can provide energy, improve immune system function temporarily, temporarily, and decrease pain sensitivity. So here we have a chart, hypothalamus, goes to the pituitary gland, right here, which goes to the adrenal glands down here, and in your torso. So stressors, we have traumatic events, life changes, hassles, and other stressors. Well, actually, we will get into those. I just realized how long the video has been going. We will get into stressors um, in the next part. But I hope you guys enjoyed this first part about you know health and stress and all that. I find it very interesting. Um, again, my name is Prescott. I'm here at Psych Saint, and I hope you guys enjoyed the video. See you next time. Bye.